Hey, I'm Adam and this is For the Love of It. It's viewers like you that keep this channel going and growing. So if you like today's video, please consider subscribing and leaving a like. Be sure to check out our weekly live Q&As on Mondays. And also, don't forget to check out the For the Love podcast, where we have seasons of podcast episodes covering all sorts of fun topics. Love you all, and thanks for joining us today. Now, let's get to the video. Life is like a series of boxes. No, not boxes of chocolate but a series of containers that take us from one point in our lives to the other. If you've ever driven late at night, you've probably experienced this before. When I was in college, I would often find myself driving eight hours back to Michigan to be with family for the holidays. At the time, I loved driving through the night. There was an otherworldly strangeness to it. It was like being adrift in a sea of endless slumber. There were hardly any other drivers on the road around me as I silently sailed through the darkness. As I drove into Michigan, the sun would start peeking over the horizon. The world around me would start to awaken, and the road I was traveling on would become busy again. During those trips, I would feel like the captain of a starship, except my ship was the inside of a car, the box in which I traveled. In fact, most of my life is lived in boxes. I drive in a box, I live in a box, I sleep in a box, within a box, I work in a box, and ultimately, we're all buried in a box. And this isn't just the case for my life either. Most people I know live their lives in boxes. We even store things in boxes and form mental boxes to help understand and comprehend things about the world around us. So. Why so many boxes? While I can't speak for everyone, my hunch is that for most of us, whether we realize it or not, boxes keep us safe. The box I live in does keep me safe from anything that might hurt or endanger me outside, like bad weather, wild animals, and other people. The box I drive in also keeps me safe from insects and animals and accidents, weather and other people. The boxes we make in our minds keep us safe from the fear of uncertainty. The more our minds can understand the world that we live in, the easier it is for them to know what is a concern and what isn't. Our minds form categories for culture, society, and most predominantly, other people. So. Are the boxes our minds make and the boxes we live in a good thing? Is it a good thing that we have surrounded ourselves with physical boxes that, although keeping us safe, separate us from the outside world and the community that we live in? Is it a good thing that we form mental boxes or worldviews around ideas, other people, and other worldviews? On one hand, boxes are an obvious necessity. Whether it be a tent in the middle of the woods or a three-story luxury home, you would be hard-pressed to find anyone that doesn't sleep with a roof over their head. These kinds of boxes, physical boxes, are, for the most part, an inescapable necessity. Furthermore, these kinds of boxes can protect us from other people. There is a reason we lock our doors and windows and why we set up doorbell cameras and motion alarms. These precautions keep us safe from others who might otherwise seek to harm or rob us. Likewise, the cars we drive employ seatbelts and airbags to keep us safe in the event of an accident or collision. Similarly, the boxes we build in our minds do serve purposes. Building a perception, profile, stereotype, or analog of a certain thing helps our brains to know if it is something to be cautious of in the future. Aristotle remarked that it is frequent repetition that produces a natural tendency. The more frequently two things are experienced together, the more likely it will be that the experience of recall of one will stimulate the recall of another. What Aristotle means is that, simply put, if I were to visit a park and almost every time I did so, I was followed by someone unknown to me. My mind would determine that it was probably not a good idea to keep 
visiting that park. It would be, as Aristotle put it, my mind's natural tendency. Or perhaps I visit a local restaurant, and despite my first meal being great, I get food poisoning during my next two visits. My mind would quickly determine that I need to find somewhere else to eat. Your mind produces these natural tendencies or mental boxes out of a subconscious desire to protect itself and those around you. So it seems like boxes aren't just good things, but it also seems like they're necessary things. I mean, I can imagine a society that is completely and utterly homogenous in every way. I can imagine people that are all alike in ethnicity, religion, philosophy, and worldview. In such a context, boxes might be less of a necessity and more of a desire. The more alike our beliefs and assumptions are, the more predictable the world will appear to our mind. As a result, our minds feel less anxious about having to deconstruct and analyze every part of our world to keep us safe. But for most peoples and cultures, this isn't the case. Yes, there is beauty and discovery and diversity, but there's also more potential danger in it, at least danger that our minds have to be aware of and prepared for. Perhaps Thomas Hobbes, a 17th century English philosopher, was right about the nature of man. He writes in his book Leviathan, Hereby it is manifest that during the time men live without a common power to keep them all in awe, they are in that condition which is called war, and such a war as is of every man against every man. On one hand, there are good reasons for the boxes we live in and construct. On the other hand, however, building boxes can be dangerous, especially the mental boxes that we build. As we grow, our brains not only naturally form boxes through experience, but they also form boxes through instruction and teaching from those around you. Often those boxes can be skewed or inaccurate. As a result, we end up forming opinions about other people that either aren't true at all or aren't true about most of them. This is one reason why social media is especially dangerous. Our mind's subconscious drive to protect and preserve can easily be manipulated and construed. Having the world at our fingertips can easily give bad actors a way to do that. We can be led to believe or do the wrong things through fear and paranoia. It becomes difficult to discern what should truly be in a box and what shouldn't. Through social media, not only have our minds become inundated with things put in boxes, but they have also become overwhelmed with trying to discern fact from fiction. Perhaps this is why it's easier for our minds to simply fully and unequivocally commit to one specific side of a spectrum or a box. That way, our brains don't need to be anxious about discerning things on their own. The more we build mental boxes around people and ideas that are around us, the bigger and more secure our physical boxes become, or at least that's how it feels. And it further separates us from those people and ideas that we might not be so afraid of if we only understood them. Whether we are fundamentally aware of it or not, our brains react the same to experiences it has in person as it does to experiences over a live stream or a YouTube video. So when it comes to building boxes, what does healthy society look like? How do we discern between what is important and what isn't? How do we determine where we should build those boxes and when we should build those boxes? Yes, it is important for us to have boxes. We form assumptions about the world around us so that we can safely live in and thrive in the world. Yet, it can be dangerous to form assumptions at the cost of other people or to create boxes in your mind that seals away the truth about the world. I wish I had an answer to every single one of those questions, but I don't. Do a search on YouTube alone and you'll probably find an incredible array of people who have their own ideas, opinions, and views on how to solve many of these questions. And this video is just one among many. But the questions themselves are still important. Asking ourselves these kinds of questions is the starting point or first step in which someday we might discover an answer. 
The fact that there are probably hundreds of videos of people asking the same questions is a good thing. The first step in fixing a problem is recognizing that there is one. Plato has often been paraphrased with the quote, a fool speaks because he has to say something, but a wise man speaks because he has something to say. Perhaps if we're slower to speak and quicker to listen, the boxes we build around us and in our lives today might be better than the ones we've built before.